I'm Imogen Matthews. I'm author of The Hidden Village. It's a novel set in World War II Holland. I'm actually English and I've lived um, in Oxford for many years. It's a beautiful city. Um, and But my mother was Dutch and she came over to England and uh, I think it was in the late 1950s. And uh, so I, I grew up as an English person, I suppose. Uh, the stories, though, that my mother told uh, me and my sisters when we were growing up were quite extraordinary. Uh, she was telling stories about her life during the German occupation in World War II, and she had quite a few really quite unbelievable stories to tell, and I'd like to share one of those with you now. So just before I read out her uh, words about this, uh, to say that she was a young woman at the beginning of the war, she was 19 years old and she was a not exactly a member of the resistance but she used to deliver leaflets on behalf of the resistance and for her the war was, yes it was a terrifying time but it was also a very exciting time and I think that really comes across um, in uh, her words here. So she says, one evening after curfew, I was in bed, and when I heard of the distance, the clutter of hobnailed boots, a raid, I thought, could it be for us? I quickly dressed. I was right. I heard the garden gate, and then they hammered on the door with rifle butts. Aufmachen, Polizei, open up, police. Well, I had documents in my possession to do with the underground. I picked them up and shot through the back door, to the, um, in the garden fence to the next door neighbours. I gave them a third of the papers with the order, destroy! As it was summer, there were no fires to burn them, so they shredded them up and tried to flush them down the toilet. I rushed into number eight, where I also dumped some papers, but there was no door to number 10, so I climbed to the top floor and hanging from the gutters, I arrived, James Bond style, on the top balcony of number 10, where I found the door ajar. I was received with some amazement, although they had heard the soldiers come. The two daughters of the house made up a bed for me. They rumpled the sheets to make it look as if I'd been sleeping in it for a while, just in case the Gestapo found me and started asking questions. I climbed in and waited. After a while, a noise. Nenny looked out. They're leaving. Are they taking my father? I asked in trepidation. I can't see him. And that was it. I could and dared not rush back. I just hoped Nenny had been right. So that was just an example of many stories that she used to tell and they certainly had a profound influence on me and, and the way that I viewed um, events that must have happened in, um, in Holland in World War II. I didn't really think about it very much even though we um, used to go on holiday, we, in fact we go on holiday to Holland every year um, and have done so since 1990. And we stay in a place called Nunspeet, which is um, a beautiful town, uh, well really it's a small town, in the Veluwe, which is um, a beautiful wooded area. And the place where we stay, we literally go out of the door, step onto our bikes, we cycle into the woods. We know those woods really well, at least I thought I knew them really well, until one day in 2011 we were cycling along and I came across a stone at the side of the path and it was a memorial stone and so we stopped and I read it and it was to the people who had helped Jews shelter in these woods in 1943 to 1944 and I thought I'd this is strange, I've never heard about this. So we started to look around and we came across these huts which had been reconstructed from the time of the World War II. And these were the, the type of huts that people were living in, in these woods. And I just wanted to show you a picture here of what these huts looked like. They were actually underground huts. They were made from wood and you can see the roof here. The roof was covered with branches, leaves, you know, all kinds of um, stuff from the forest floor. 
so that they wouldn't be seen from, um, from the outside. And then if you actually go into the huts, which you can do, and this was the most astonishing thing, is that they were really dark and dingy and no uh, windows, wooden benches. There were one or two um, examples of um, like a table and one or two stools, a very rough floor. And in these huts, up to eight or nine people were living at any one time. And there were perhaps about nine or ten huts. And at one time, apparently, there were nearly a hundred people who were living in the woods. And they managed to, to do this through the um, sacrifice, goodwill, generosity, whatever you want call to call it, of the local community who pulled together and had this village built to help Jews, predominantly Jews, escape from the Germans because we all know what would have happened if they had been caught. After I found this uh, amazing village right in the middle of the woods, I went back home and I wanted to find out more about it. So I started to do some research and found there really wasn't an awful lot about it. Uh, it was almost like people didn't know about it. I did find one book which was very helpful and it was um, written by somebody who had interviewed a lot of people um, who had actually lived um, at that time both in and outside um, the, um, the village so that was extremely helpful but I didn't want to write a history book I wanted to write a fiction book and with my mother's stories going through my head I wanted to write about the, from the perspective of two young people one who um, was outside the village and the other was inside the village so my character Jan he is a boy of 11 who is a, a typical tearaway boy who um, enjoys adventures and he is forever going into the woods and his parents are not very happy about this because they know that the Germans are patrolling around and they literally they're looking for they're looking for people they they can arrest whether they're Jews or people who are trying to escape them so he is my main character, one of my main characters, and then the other character is Sophie, and she's a young Jewish girl who is having a lovely life at the age of 16, um, and then all of a sudden she has to disappear, and her family has to disappear because the Germans are coming round, they're rounding people up, they're sending them off to concentration camps. So Sophie is one of the first people to go into the village, but she can't go with her parents because there's not enough space. And I think this was quite a common thing that families were torn apart by the war. So it's really about also her um, adapting to life in a very enclosed environment. Um, and you've seen these pictures, which uh, it is quite difficult to imagine, but uh, people were literally prepared to do anything to survive. So. Uh, the two stories run side by side, and then there's also running through the whole of the novel, there is a sense of, there's a community that's prepared to put themselves out and not just build huts for these people, but to provide them with everything they need, the food, the water, the medicines. If anybody falls ill, somebody, they have to be brought out of the camp under um, cover of darkness. So it was a, it's terrifying. Again, I wanted to get across this sense that it was terrifying, but actually it was exhilarating as well. So it's these two, two elements. And then also there's under, the undercurrent really is we have to be careful. We just don't know who we might be betraying. So that is really the essence of the book. And I've been overwhelmed really by the response to the book. It's been phenomenal, uh, not just in my own country, but worldwide. It really does seem to have struck a chord and I've had, I'm very, very grateful for the many reviews I've had, which, which really talk about, you know, thank you so much for bringing to life these stories. And this particular story, we knew nothing about this. We didn't know that Holland was involved in this way. And so it's been a, a fantastic journey and um, it, it's brilliant. So thank you so much.